for my role as Deputy Dean um, of the University of Otago Wellington campus. Um, but I'm also uh, Professor of Pediatrics, so I know Lynette very well. I want to welcome you all to our campus and thank you for coming to this lecture. And I bring a very sincere apologies from Professor Sunny Collins, who really unavoidably couldn't be here tonight. Lynette um, is a graduate of the University of Otago, and I first met Lynette when I came to work here in 1995. And I don't know if it was uh, connected that she left a year later and went <laughs> to Vancouver um, to pursue her training in neurology. Um, but I had known her over a long period of time. She graduated RACP in 1999 and then came back as a senior lecturer in the department and we've worked in the same department ever since. She was promoted to associate professor in 2014. Um, as Harleen has indicated, um, Lynette is a physician scientist, so she combines a clinical practice with her research. And her expertise is in epilepsy phenotyping, and she's going to tell you all about that, I think. So, but she, it's important to understand that she leads not only the epilepsy research group here um, at the University of Otago Wellington, but is connected to uh, very prestigious research groups in, at the University of Melbourne and overseas. Uh, where they all work together and have made amazing discoveries in the genetics of epilepsy. To undertake this research uh, that is very immediately translational, Lynette has secured external research grant funding of over four million dollars as a principal investigator as well as other money uh, through other grants and she's had two HRC project grants which is no mean feat, particularly as a clinician scientist. She's had collaborations around the world, as I've suggested, I've indicated, and she's got over 90 publications now related to this work, with an H index of 27 and 3,615 citations as of October this year. I think it's important also, though, that you understand that she's really on the international stage in regards to her service. Um, in regard to epilepsy, and with significant roles in the International League Against Epilepsy, and she ex established the New Zealand chapter of that in 2005, was vice president for six years and has been president for six years. And so she's really advocated for epilepsy care in New Zealand and for more information and patient information and related to that. The other thing that I think is of huge significance that it was that she was a member of the ILAE classification task force. So this was an international task force um, who had, that had the job of deciding on the new diagnostic classifications for epilepsy. Uh, and she was responsible for collecting seizure videos and putting them online. And that is now an online resource that's used internationally. And we are very lucky in our department because that resource is also used to teach our students. Um, and it's probably something to do with the fact that she always gets one to 100% fantastic feedback from the students in regard to her teaching. And so not um, being happy with just teaching medical students, she's also teaching pediatricians both here and overseas in regards to epilepsy. And last Friday, I think it was, I wondered what had happened in our department because there was absolutely nobody around and they were all at one of the next um, epilepsy courses learning more about epilepsy. Thought we'd been hit by a bomb or something, but it was just, it was just the epilepsy teaching. <laughs> so Lynette is not only giving those courses, but she's involved internationally in the curricula for those courses. So, as well as doing all that, um, Lynette, because we are a small department, had to take on the usual roles of fifth year convening, and she's currently the sixth year convener, and she's been acting head of department at times. And as Harlan's indicated, she does this on a 0.5 academic appointment and a 0.4 clinical appointment. At home, I know Lynette is very well supported by her husband David, who's here today, and her son Sean, who I know will be watching at some stage. And I just have to acknowledge you, Sean, because as a very young child, Sean often assisted Lynette with her neurology teaching. Uh, and he's probably had more neurological examinations than any other normal <laughs> child who was brought up in Wellington. Um, so a shout out to Sean. And Dave, I think you can just be glad that she's a pediatric neurologist <laughs> and not an adult neurologist, so you were safe. 
the net, your career has really gone from strength to strength, and it's been exciting for me to watch that. Like all of us here and, on, and online, um, I'm very much looking forward to what you have to tell us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Don. Make sure we're all bits and pieces in the right places. Um, I've got lots of wires everywhere. Um, so thank you very much, Don, and thank you very much to all of you for coming to listen to me talk today. Um, I was just, when Don was talking, I was, uh, reminded me of the fact that about 24 years ago, just after Don arrived and I escaped, um, I, <laughs> I was a pediatric registrar and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I knew I wanted to come back to Wellington and I had accepted a job at BC Children's Hospital and uh, doing pediatric neurology, which wasn't something I really w wanted to do, but everybody around here had said that would be a good thing to do if I wanted to come back to Wellington. And I remember sitting on the airplane just as we were taking off with Dave and, um, and flying out of Wellington thinking, okay, take a breath. You're gonna do pediatric neurology. It's all gonna be good. And then I thought to myself, oh, I hope I don't have to see too many people with epilepsy. I really don't understand it. <laughs> And I was lucky because I was at a fantastic hospital with two amazing clinicians, Mary Connolly and Kevin Farrell, who not only taught me an awful lot about epilepsy, but really imparted on me the passion that they had for helping people with this um, disorder. So I'm going to get started and I'm going to, um, so I'm not, we're going to pass that. <laughs> okay, I'd talk to you about the teams I've been involved in, the genes that we've found, and the dreams that we have. So first of all, just to make sure everybody is, uh, knows what we're talking about, uh, and it's epilepsy. Now, you're all sitting there. Oh, sorry, wrong. Let's go back here. Let's see. It should just, there we go. Okay. So this is what's happening in all of your brains right now. You've got your brain cells, and they're busy sending electrical impulses to all the other cells, and that allows you to hear me and to see and to think. And that's all normal. This electrical activity is what makes your brain work. But every once in a while, People can have electrical activity that they don't want to have, and it's associated with a clinical symptom or a sign, and that is what we call an epileptic seizure. And seizures are common, so one in 20 people will have a seizure at some stage in their life. And epilepsy is a disorder or a group of disorders, as I'm gonna tell you in a minute, where people have recurrent seizures. And there's a lot of people in New Zealand with active epilepsy, so about 27,000, so that's all of the people in this stadium. When we think about epilepsy, we talk about, sometimes people talk about epilepsy as a disease or disorder, but it isn't, it's a group of disorders. So just like you can see on this slide, there's a lot of fruit there, but uh, it doesn't take too much observation for you to notice that actually there's pears and bananas and apples and oranges. And so it's the same in epilepsy. It's a group of disorders and the disorders are called epilepsy syndromes. So the epilepsy syndromes are defined based on the age of onset of the seizures, the types of seizures that people have, what happens to their cognitive development, what we see on their neurological exam and on their EEG and on their imaging of their brain. Now, there are a lot of different epilepsy syndromes and it's a spectrum. You've got the good epilepsies and the very bad epilepsies and lots of things in between. But for the rest of this talk, I'm going to dichotomize them a little bit artificially and I'm gonna talk about the good epilepsies and the bad epilepsies. So the good epilepsies happen in normal people who live normal lives and they present with some seizures and they take a pill and usually that stops their epilepsy. And often if they have seizures starting in childhood, they'll outgrow them, so that's all great. But even in people with good epilepsies, they're more likely to have problems with learning, they're more likely to have behavioral problems, they're more likely to end up with some mental health disorders, and in at least a third of them, we can't stop their seizures with the drugs that we have available. Most people have epilepsy as a lifelong condition. And then we have this really horrible thing called SUDEP, which is sudden unexplained death in epilepsy patients, where people just don't wake up in the morning. And there's still a lot of social stigma out there and discrimination, which re results in reduced interaction, less employment, particularly if you can't drive because you're having seizures, and that overall ends up with a, a reduced quality of life for some people with supposedly good epilepsy. So the good epilepsies sometimes aren't that great, but the bad epilepsies are just terrible. So the most severe epilepsies are the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, or the DEEs, and that's a relatively new term. And what we're talking about with an epileptic encephalopathy is when you have frequent seizures and interictal, inter so that's between seizures, electrical activity, 
which results in uh, in negative impact on the developing brain. So you have uh, cognitive and behavioral impairments which are above and beyond what you would expect from the underlying pathology. And so the situation is you have a lovely little baby who's born and is doing all the right things it's supposed to do. And then at some stage, in the first few years of their life, they start having seizures. And then they might have frequent seizures or very long seizures and their EEG is very abnormal. And these two things impact negatively on their development and they end up with developmental slowing, so they don't progress like they should, or they lose skills. And these developmental and epileptic encephalopathies usually present in childhood. They're not uncommon, so five times more common than childhood cancer, about one in 2,000 births. Often end up with intellectual disability and autism. We have a really hard time treating these children and the mortality rate is high. And so it's because the good epilepsies can sometimes be not that great, and the bad epilepsies are really bad, that the World Health Organization has declared that epilepsy is the most common serious brain disorder in the world. So now that everybody is, uh, understands what we're talking about and why it's important that we do research, now I'm going to talk about uh, the teams that I've been lucky enough to be involved in. So who are the teams? This is not my team. <laughs> this is the Russian synchronized swimming team. <laughs> and um, so, uh, but sports teams, science teams, they all have some things in common. They all have a goal, and it's usually winning or scoring or finding answers. And people in the team all have a job to do, and everybody has to work together to do that. So in this particular instance, the job of this team, apart from winning the gold medal at the Olympics, is they're about to throw that girl miles into the air, and everybody has a place and a job to do. So some people have to hold her still, she has to do the flip, other people have to have the power. And if it, I get it, and they all do it together, and it all works out well, and then we get the amazing, woohoo! <laughs> okay, so I'm not talking about sports teams now, I'm talking about science teams. So the first sort of most direct science team that I'm involved in is the epilepsy research group here at the University of Otago. And our aim is to uh, improve the quality of life for children with epilepsy and their families. And this is a, a picture of um, some of the people in our team. This was taken last year, so it's a little bit out of date. And we've got all the names of the fantastic students and research assistants and postdocs that have been crucial to the success of our group and to um, the outcomes that we have uh, been able to achieve. Now we, we are a fun little group, but we <laughs> play with big, lots of people. And so the bigger group that we work with, as Don said, is the University of Melbourne. Um, and we have a lot to do them, with them on a very weekly basis. We've had an hour and a half with them on the teleconference today. Um, and we go and see them over in Melbourne at least a couple of times a year. And so this group uh, is predominantly from the U University of Melbourne. And I'd just like to specifically uh, point out Ingrid Sheffer, a laureate professor Ingrid Sheffer, who is a very, very dear friend and uh, an amazing collaborator. And she has been instrumental in um, a starting, well, in helping me. She, mentor, she supervised my PhD or my doctorate. And she has been uh, a really strong mentor and collaborator ever since. There is also a lot of other people in that group. So we've got Melody Barlow, who, does our bio, who is a bioinformatician at the WEHI, Joseph Getz and Steve Petru, who are basic scientists, they're physiologists, so they look at cells and animals. And Heather, Washington, Heather Method, who's at University of Washington, as she's a geneticist, and she, uh, you'll hear, as I say, she, we do a lot of work with her. But we're, that's not enough people for our team. We have even bigger teams. So we are also all involved in these big American teams, so EP, GP, EPI4K, and EPI25. These are NIH, that's National Institute of Health, US-funded projects. EPI25 is aiming to sequence the genetic material of 25,000 people with epilepsy. And as you can see here, this is from year one. We're now up to year four. These are all the different countries that are involved, and um, all of the participants in our research project also participate to this big collaboration. Now, that's all the scientists that I'm involved in, but the biggest, most important part of, or the teams that I, um, I'm lucky enough to have anything have to have to do with, is um, the participants and the people that refer these these uh, individuals to us. So we're really fortunate. They've got a fantastic group of pediatricians, pediatric neurologists, and geneticists around New Zealand that refer us patients with epilepsy, and we they refer us individuals with epilepsy, and individuals of course come with families. Some people that have 
uh, epilepsy and some people that don't. And what we do, so my team, we recruit these people and then we look at their notes and we um, interview them and we look at videos and we look at all their investigations and we phenotype them. So phenotype is a sort of a fancy word which basically means finding all about all the clinical stuff about these individuals. And once we do that, we can then put them into groups of like syndromes so that we can make genetic discoveries from those groups. And we have over 2,000 people affected with epilepsy who are now part of our epilepsy genetics research project coming from all over New Zealand. And I am, so this is just a few of those 2,000, some really happy girls that sent me some photos for this um, presentation. And here are a few of the boys. And these kids and their families don't, as Don said, they don't just help with research, they help with everything. They, do they help with teaching, they um, give videos of their seizures. And as Don said, I was lucky enough to be involved in the ILAE uh, flagship educational project, which was epilepsydiagnosis.org. And this is, um, it was, it's, the aim of it is to increase the skill of people who help uh, manage and diagnose epilepsy. So it's for health workers all over the world. It's a free online resource. And as Don said, you, there's seizures on here and you can go and see videos. And as, that was my job was to get the video. So lots of the videos in this um, website are from people that are in our research project. So now let's move on from teams and talk a bit about genes. So it wasn't that long ago, what's that, 25 years ago? Yeah, um, no, more than that, 35 years ago. Well, <laughs> well, we didn't really know very much about what caused epilepsy. So this is a pie chart, um, and you can see that the big hunk of people, unknown. But now in 2019, at least in the developed world, we know that the vast majority of people have epilepsy because of an abnormality in their genetic code. Now, if you are a mother who's got tri these two beautiful triplets and they have start having seizures all at the same time and their EEG looks like this, or you're somebody who lives in this family and everybody who is green has epilepsy, you don't need somebody like me to come along and say, hey, I think it might be genetic because you've probably figured that out. Now, but what does that mean, genetic? Okay, so some of you in the audience, my husband, one of them, um, might not know that much about genetics. <laughs> So we're going, to give you, <laughs> we're going to give you a little crash easy course. So hopefully you all remember that your body is made up of lots and lots and billions of cells. And in those cells is the genetic material, the genome. And we all, that genetic material is organized into chromosomes. We all have 23 pairs of chromosomes. It's a great thing. We have two copies of everything. And the chromosomes are made up of these long strands of DNA. And the DNA is made up of nucleic acids, and each of these letters represents a different nucleic acid. And that is the code that we talk about when we're talking about our genetic code. When you have length, certain lengths of the DNA, code for proteins, and they're called genes. So genes code for proteins, and proteins are basically what make you you. And you know, we start off as a single cell. And in the first 40 weeks of, of your, just when you're still inside your mummy's tummy, um, it, it, that cell replicates over and over again. And then you get out and you keep replicating over and over and over again. And so the genetic material in each cell has to keep copying over and over and over. And how a lot more mistakes aren't made is just incredible. But every once, so, and how does it, what, do we, what happens? Well, the DNA uncurls and then our body is able to make a copy of each side so that the strands are the same and one goes to one cell and the other goes to the other cell. But every once in a while, something goes wrong. So there's a change in the code. Now, not every change in the co code is bad. A lot of changes in the code don't seem to make any difference at all. But some of those changes we call pathogenic variants or mutations. And, that, and so what you see here is the DNA is unwound and it's copying. And this is copied correctly, a green with a purple. But this one here should be a green and a purple too, but it's a red. So that's an error. Okay, and so that is what we call a pathogenic variant or a mutation, and it leads to abnormal protein, and that abnormal protein leads to a disease, and we're, what we're talking about today is epilepsy. Now, it can be just a single base, these are called base pairs, which um, it has an abnormality, or you can actually end up with a whole hunk of genes or parts of genes that can get deleted or copied, and we call those copy number variations. 
So epilepsy gene discovery is relatively a uh, new thing. And the first discoveries were made in these big families with lots of people with epilepsy. So everybody in blue has epilepsy. And what the researchers did was they compared the genetic material of the people who had epilepsy to the genetic material of the people that didn't in the families to find out what was different. And this was a, it, it, back in the day when they did this, they used a pretty clunky uh, genetic technology, which was very expensive and which took a lot of time. But it was successful, and the first epilepsy gene was discovered in 1995. And this technique is done in big families. Lots of genes were discovered over the next 10 years. So it's not over and over. It's becoming a big family with lots of people with epilepsy. But what about everybody else? <laughs> family with epilepsy, or in the severe epilepsies, we usually have this situation where you have one severely affected child and nobody else that has epilepsy. And it's because of that that people, prior to the discovery of epilepsy genes, people just assumed that the problem was acquired. Something happened, there was a drug that you took in the pregnancy or some mm. virus or something went wrong at the birth and that this, it was an acquired cause. But in around 2000, we realized that was not the case. In fact, these were also genetic epilepsies. And it started with SCN1A. So SCN1A is the most important epilepsy gene. So if you'll, uh, I'm going to show you lots of genes today, and they're just a whole bunch of, of letters. But SCN1A is the one to remember. And so it was first discovered in, uh, in 2000. And it was discovered in this family. This was a family Ingrid Shefford um, described. And everybody in this family who's colored in has epilepsy, but they have mild epilepsy. So they might have just seizures with fever, or seizures with fever and the odd other seizure. And most of these people outgrew their epilepsy. And so it was discovered that in this family that the problem was a, a pathogenic variant in the SCM1A gene. And so a group of clever Belgians thought, hmm, what about Dravet syndrome? Now, Dravet syndrome is not a, uh, a good epilepsy. It's a bad epilepsy. It's an epileptic encephalopathy. So what made them think that that might be related? Well, this syndrome presents at roughly the same age as the people in that family. It also presents with seizures with fever. And so they thought, well, that's kind of similar. Maybe that's important. But that's about where it ends in terms of the similarity for Dravet syndrome, because the kids with Dravet have frequent seizures, and they have long seizures, uh, and they have lots of different types of seizures, and they may start off with normal development, well, usually, but then they tend to go on to end up with uh, mild to severe intellectual disability, and that's because of the encephalopathy, the epileptic encephalopathy. Their MRIs are normal, and they have generalized spike and wave on their EEG, and what the Belgians did is they took a group of children with Dravet syndrome, so these are individuals with nobody else in the family, so, and they looked for SCM1A mutations. And what they found, and what's been subsequently found over and over, is that Dravet syndrome is caused by genetic mutations in SCN1A, in at least 90%. And these are mostly de novo. What does de novo mean? De novo basically means it's not inherited. Okay, so it's still genetic, but it's new in the child. So we have this situation here, a child with severe epilepsy. And remember, you've got two copies of everything. So this is the mutation. And then they've got one good copy, OK? And everybody else has just got lots of good copies. So this is de novo. It's new in the child. So sodium, SCN1A codes for a protein which is on the, in the sodium channel in the brain. And this is, oh, no, it isn't. Go back. Uh, so this is a cartoon of that. So this is a cell. So you can see here, this is the cell. And then um, here's the cell membrane, and this is inside the cell. And this is the sodium channel, and its job is to help the sodium ions come into um, the channel, into the cell. And this is another picture of the protein, but not nearly as pretty. Um, but this is inside the cell, and this is outside of the cell. And each of these different colored blocks here, these little squares and circles, show different places in the protein where there's a mutation which is causing the protein not to work very well. And SCN1A is a very big gene as far as genes go. Uh, and, but the vast majority of people who have mutations, they have their own unique mutation. So only about 18% of people who have mutations in this gene have the same one as somebody else. So everybody's got their own sort of unique variation. And what happens in the mild epilepsy, the big family, as well as Drave, is that the protein just doesn't work very well. And so you have a loss of function. So remember, you have two copies. One copy is doing its bit. The other copy isn't doing so good. So you haven't got enough. 
Now, I was fortunate enough to start into the world of epilepsy genetic research around about the time when molecular genetic advances were occurring. And these were amazing because not only, um, because they did things much faster, much better, and much cheaper. <laughs> so this has made a huge difference in terms of our ability to uh, do genetic discoveries. And so we, in the New Zealand cohort, we use a variety of different molecular techniques, uh, arrays, targeted sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and whole genome sequencing. I'm going to explain that in a minute uh, to make our genetic discoveries. So the first one is the array. Okay, so this is a relatively pretty diagram, but it's a bit complicated. Basically, what the arrays do is they allow us to see not the single, so remember the DNA where the mistake was made, um, and, the per, uh, and the purple and the red, or the red and the green, whatever it was. Um, so, and I talked about how big hunks of gene can be missing or duplicated. Okay, the arrays help us pick up that, that structural variation. And so with Heather Method, the University of Washington, she used this technique um, on 315 uh, children from New Zealand and Australia, our New Zealand and Australia cohort, and she was able to demonstrate that 8% of kids their epilepsy, their severe epilepsy was caused by de novo, so new, not in the parents, big copy number variation. And this test is now standard for all children who have any sort of an epileptic encephalopathy. So the next molecular genetic advance that uh, came around, which was great, is next generation parallel sequencing. And this, again, it, it's really, uh, it allows us to do things really quick. And what it does is it sequences the genome and it can sequence every single part of the genome, or it can just sequence the exons, which are the part that are important that, co that um, code for proteins, or you can use different techniques to just, and so that can be of all of the genes, or you can just look at specific genes. And so the Epi24, sorry, the Epi4K team uh, used one of these techniques, whole exon sequencing, on trios, and what that means is the child and the parent to look for de novo new changes in the child that were not in the parent. And they were able to show it's not just Drave syndrome, but all epileptic encephalopathies, a de novo pathogenic variants are uh, important in terms of the cause. Heather Method uses, Heather, Heather Method, yes, uses uh, a different technique, molecular inversion probes, which is the targeted sequencing. So in this study, what she did with 519 of our kids from New Zealand and Australia is she looked really hard at 64 genes that we thought might be involved in epilepsy. And this was a very uh, successful and resulted in these two Nature Genetic papers which were published in, July, in 2013. Uh, which identified some new epilepsy genes. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about GRIN2A and the epilepsy aphasia spectrum disorders. So the epilepsy aphasia spectrum is a, oh, I have to make sure I don't shine this in somebody's eyes, um, is <laughs> a group of epilepsies. And so you can have the mild ones, which are up the top. So normal intellect may have a bit of language problems and maybe the odd seizure, EEG is pretty good. And then the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies at the bottom where they have severe intellectual disabilities, um, seizures and language problems, and their EEG is just terrible. So when they fall asleep at night, their EEG is just black. It's got all this electrical activity on it. And so it was this group of epileptic encephalopathies that we found that the gene GRIN2A was responsible. Um, and these are the families in that paper that uh, these discoveries were made. And so you might notice, though, that these aren't de novo. <laughs> so the individuals that were in the paper, uh, or the individuals that were originally screened as part of the 519, were the ones with the arrows. And this family here is a New Zealand family. And you can see that the mutation, so everybody that's colored has an epileptic aphasia syndrome. And you can see that the mutation M is uh, it's what we call segregates, which means that it is in all of the people that have the epilepsy. GRIN2A encodes for a glutamate NMDA receptor subunit on the, um, one of them. And it's important because it is responsible for excitation in the nerve cells. So that's all very well, so that's just one of the genes, and that's, that's all um, very well, but it's not just about finding the genes. What's also really important is once we identify a gene, we go back to the people who have an abnormality in the gene, and we find out more about them. 
because we want to be able to say what is going to happen to somebody who has a gene, has a mutation in this gene, and how can we treat these people in the best way so they have the best outcome. So we go back to the people who we've already phenotyped and look at them in more detail and try to figure out what kind of epilepsies do they have, what other kind of uh, associated uh, problems do they have, how can we treat that. And so using this methodology, uh, we, with, our, um, other, with our, all of the teams that I showed you, have been really successful. The New Zealand kids have contributed to the discovery of these new epilepsy, gene epilepsy genes, as well as delineate the phenotype and more information about these other ones. Now, I can see, you know, those are just a bunch of letters on a screen, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. So I'm going to move, some of these genes are for the bad epilepsies, and some of these genes are for the good epilepsies. Um, so I'm going to now move to talk a sort of a bigger picture and what we've kind of learnt about over the last 20 years uh, in terms of understanding um, epilepsy genetics. So unfortunately, it's not as simple as you would like. And what we realize is it's not just one syndrome is caused by one gene, and it's not one gene causes one syndrome. So you can have a single gene which can cause a mild epilepsy in some people, depending on the variant, and a really severe epilepsy in the other. And of course, you can say to me, um, oh, I know that because you've just told me about SCM1A. And they had that mild family, and they had the severe epilepsy of Dravet syndrome. But it's even more complicated than that because SCM1A causes more types of um, epileptic encephalopathies than just Dravet syndrome. And so last year, no, a few years ago, we published uh, a new one called infantile, Early Infantile SCM1A Encephalopathy. And so this type of epilepsy is more severe than Dravet. The kids present earlier at three months of age. They have similar types of seizures, um, and their development is normal to begin with, but they have a much poorer progression, and they um, end up profoundly disabled. They're not able to talk, they're not able to walk, and they often can't feed themselves, and they have to have G-tubes put in. And then the other really distinctive thing about their phenotype is its movement disorder. And so here you can see three of those boys, and it's just that it's boys and girls, but for some reason these are three boys. Um, and you can see that they're constantly moving. So this is this really um, pronounced movement disorder that's associated with this particular SCM1A uh, phenotype. And the other thing, remember, I told you when we looked at that uh, picture of the gene and we had all the different unique variants on SCN1A, uh, that everybody has their own sort of own variant. Well, in this particular syndrome, that's not the case. So we were able to show that almost all of them had exactly the same mutation. And it was at a protein at the 226 area. And that allowed our colleagues, our basic science colleagues in Melbourne, to look at that in much more detail. So they put that mutation into frog's eggs. And we also took some skin biopsies, so some skin from the children that we had identified with this syndrome. They turned those skin cells into nerve cells. And they were able to look and see what actually, what was, what was, what was going wrong in those cells. Why did um, that mutation cause a problem? And what they found is, unlike the other types of SCM1A uh, disorders, which caused a loss of function, this caused a gain of function. And so basically it's, um, and that's why they were such a, a more severe uh, phenotype. Now, that's the one gene causes many syndromes, but one syndrome also can be caused by many genes. So the other syndrome here, uh, epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures, this is, uh, we've just published a review of 130 cases. And you can see that, no you can't unless I show you this way, you can see that uh, seven cases were caused by SCM1A, but there were 23 other genes that caused the same syndrome. So it is all very much more complicated than we had really hoped. But you're saying, so what does it matter? All those letters on a page, how's that going to help anybody? Okay, so it's all about clinical translation. How does it, where is the impact? So we've got our little baby here with a genetic uh, abnormality in their brain. And ideally, the situation we want to be in and what we're definitely moving towards is that somebody will come in, a baby will come in with seizures and they'll have a blood test and they will get a genetic diagnosis. Now, 
In some countries in the world, that does happen, that they get a blood test right away. It doesn't happen here quite yet, but that is where we will move to. And a genetic diagnosis makes a difference because it means that these kids don't have to any, have any more investigations. And these children with severe epilepsies get a lot of investigations <laughs> trying to find the cause because it's just awful. These kids are having lots of seizures and people want to know what's hap why has this happened. It also allows us to, a genetic diagnosis allows us to be able to talk to the families and give them a plan or an idea of what's going to happen. So if this is a benign epilepsy or a good epilepsy where their kids are going to stop seizing and they're going to go to school and do everything that they, their parents had planned for them, or whether they're actually going to be difficult to treat and have a, a, a less um, positive outcome and allows them to plan and, and get organized. And it also has an impact, a major psychosocial impact, because parents um, often feel really guilty. Because remember, we, you know, originally people thought this was acquired. They think, oh, I did something wrong, or I didn't do something right. Uh, and, and so this helps remove that guilt. And it also allows them to hook up with other people, with families who have uh, similar kids with similar genetic disorders, and get some support. And then, of course, remember, these are small children. So these are children in families who are wanting to have more children. And so they want to have information and be able to make informed genetic, uh, sorry, reproductive decisions. And so we've been doing a lot of work on that uh, in the last few years. And we've been looking at something called mosaicism. So remember that the epileptic encephalopathies are mostly de novo diseases. So mom, dad, two copies of a gene, all normal, baby, bad epilepsy, one bad copy, okay? And so this family here, you would have taken blood from all three of these people, you'd pick up the variant in this child and they, you don't pick up a variant in the parents and they're told that the recurrence risk is very low. But it's not nothing, it's still, there's still a possibility and you're thinking, well, how can that be? And that is because of this phenomenon and that's mosaicism. So in mosaicism, you get, um, so you've got your egg and your sperm, they get together, form a cell, and the cell hasn't got a mutation. And then somewhere early on, you get a, an error. And so what, this cell's got a mutation. These cells are all good. They all keep replicating so that some of the cells have got mutations, some of them don't. And you end up with an individual who has got some cells that have got a mutation in them and some cells which don't. So that's what mosaicism is. And this can be something in the child. So you can have a mosaic child. So here we go. We've got mom, dad, no problem, first cells, few cells, and then somewhere along here in the cells, let me turn around, in the cells that um, are going to form the brain, a mutation happens, and so the child's brain has this mutation and they have uh, bad epilepsy. And we and others have done some special, um, with Heather Method, have done some really uh, high, what we call deep sequencing, which means we look in the blood, but we look really hard, we sequence it over and over and over again, so we can pick up really low levels of changes and variation in the blood. And we've found that in Dravet syndrome, that in kids who've just had a normal blood test and have been said that there is no abnormality, that if you do this really deep sequencing, in about 10% of them, what's actually happened is they're mosaic and it's mostly just in their brain and not in the rest of them. Uh, and this can also happen in the parents. So here we have uh, mom or dad, a very non-gender specific cartoon. And uh, so at some stage early on in their, uh, in utero, they had a mutation, and that uh, ends up being cells that are just in, the, in their reproductive system. So they're all fine from a, uh, this mutation perspective, except for in their uh, gonads. And so they can pass on sperm and egg with the mutation, even though they don't have the disorder. And so last year, we published in the New England Journal of Medicine this paper um, on that topic, on parental mosaicism in supposedly de novo uh, epileptic encephalopathies. And what um, we did, and Heather used uh, this deep sequ sequencing technique, on 120 trios, uh, so these are children who were known to have a mutation in a gene that causes epileptic encephalopathy, and their parents who were felt to not have it, based on the standard sort of testing. And so she, we did a very deep sequencing, and of the 120, 10 of them, we were able to identify the same genetic mutation in a parent that was in the child. So what that meant was that 8.3% of these supposedly de novo uh, families that the child didn't inherit it, the child did inherit it from a mosaic parent. And that's important for genetic counseling because prior to having that sort of testing done, everybody's just given this low risk, but it's not a no risk. 
Um, but when, if you can do this testing, if you can pick up that the child is, is mosaic, then there's no way their parents can pass it on because the mutation happened in the child, okay? They're mosaic. If you can pick up that the parent is mosaic, then they've actually got a really high risk of passing it on to their child. It's almost one in, 50, it's one in two, 50%. And the ones in the middle have a much, much lower risk than, we, than, than previously, but it can't be zero because we don't, we don't know that we can always pick up in blood really low levels of mosaicism. So mosaicism has been underappreciated both in parents and in child. And we now know that in around about 10% or almost 10% of both children or parents can be mosaic. And that's really important for reproductive counseling. OK, so now we're moving on to the last part, the dreams. So what are our dreams? We're dreaming of effective treatments. We're dreaming of good outcomes or better outcomes. And ultimately, we want to cure this disorder. So the first thing is about treatment now, and we're definitely making steps in the, in, in the right direction towards these dreams. And so uh, as a pediatric epileptologist, I have a lot of different anti-epileptic medications I can choose from when a child comes in with seizures. And it's really, to some extent, it's often sort of random which one you might choose. Um, so it's, what we know is that by identifying the gene and making a genetic diagnosis, that directs the therapy in terms of what drug is the best to, to use. And so that the children will have less seizures, and if you have less seizures, then you have a better outcome. And so there, um, a study in Scotland, this was an amazing study in Scotland done by Joe Sim Simons, um, and they looked at every single child in Scotland over three years who had seizures. Just presented with seizures, they all got, so under three years of age, new onset seizures, they all got genetic testing of the known epilepsy genes. And they found, were able to identify that in one third of cases, they could make a genetic diagnosis. And the most common gene that they identified was a gene called PRIT2, which we identified in 2012. And that's a gene that is, causes a very, very mild type of epilepsy where children have a lot of seizures, um, but then they outgrow it and they're absolutely fine. And then SCN1A. And if you looked at just at the epileptic encephalopathy, so just the bad um, epilepsies in that age group, they were able to show that half of them could be diagnosed genetically uh, with one of the known epilepsy genes. But the best thing was they uh, reported that just having the diagnosis of the, gene the genetic diagnosis had an impact on treatment, so that's just the sort of things that you're going to choose, in 76% of them. So even just, uh, so even finding the diagnosis makes an impact on the drugs that we already have. And there's a lot of examples of that, uh, but I'm just going to talk to you about one of them, and that is about PCDH19. So this is a, um, a gene which causes girls clustering epilepsy. It's only in girls, and I'm not going to go into that. That is a cool other story, but it's a bit long. Um, and so these kids present at one year of age. They have clusters of seizures, and what I mean by that is they have... Um, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 seizures in a few days to a week, and then they'll go for months with nothing, okay? Um, and the seizures um, impact negatively on their developments. They start off with normal development, but most of them end up with mild or uh, to severe ID. And they often have um, problems with behavior and autistic features. And it's caused by this gene, PCH19, which encodes for a protein called podocarin 19, which is responsible for helping cells to stick together. And what we have been able to show or found is that this particular type of epilepsy responds really well to a drug that we have available, and that is levetiracetam. And so, um, and we had discovered this independently, um, Ingrid Sheffer with her kids and me with mine. So this is one of my children that I looked after. So she started having seizures when she was one. These are clusters of seizures, and this is her age, okay? So, and she had 12 to 18 clusters of seizures every year. And I had to put this into perspective, she was in hospital for 111 days in the first four years of her life. She had over 800 seizures. And every time she had a cluster, she lost developmental skills. And I tried every anti-epileptic medication I had. And then it was around about the time that this new drug, levetiracetam, came on the market. So it was just the, the only thing I had left to try. So I tried it, and it was like a miracle. She just stopped seizing. And it was around about this same time that our colleagues in Australia identified the gene PCDH19. 
And because she and other girls that I look at, well, all the kids that I look after are in that study, they were all screened for that. And she ended up, we found out that she, her epilepsy was caused by variations in this gene. And I had four, four other girls who also were bad and had um, epilepsy caused by this gene. And here's a picture of two of their um, seizure histories. And you can see exactly the same thing. As soon as I put them on levotrastam, their seizures stopped. So we have um, reported two different cohorts. There's a research cohort of 17 girls where uh, those are girls who are in our study and another cohort where parents are responding to a survey. And what we found is that between uh, 59 or 31 and 59 percent of them have become seizure free for at least 24 months on levetiracetam. Now to just to put that into perspective, um, in the trials of levetiracetam when it first came on the market when they were giving it to people with bad epilepsy, um, those are placebo controlled trials, only about 18 percent of people became seizure free for three to six months. This group of very severe epilepsy almost 60% are becoming seizure-free for two years. So it really seems to be a specific drug to help these kids. And now finally, what it's all really about is we're trying to do precision therapy. So what we want to try to do is find drugs that work just on that specific gene, not drugs that just happen to work well in those cases. Um, and there's a various ways um, that this is happening, and I'm not involved in this research that I'm going to be telling you about, but you can't do this sort of research unless you find the gene first. So we're going to talk about precision medicine in SCN1A. And the precision medicine is uh, something called ASOs, antisense oligonucleotides. And these are genetic pieces of genetic material that can be made in the lab. And what they do is they attach to the gene, and they can either upregulate it or downregulate it. Um, and so um, there are a few different experiments. Uh, um, types of epilepsy genes where this is being tried, but the one that's the most far ahead is the SCM1A. And so Stoke Therapeutics presented this last year at the American Epilepsy Society. They call their ASO Tango. <laughs> um, and, but basically, this is a very crude diagram. But basically, so this is SCM1A. This is the good gene. This is the bad gene. And so remember, you've got two copies. It's a loss of function. So usually, you get about 50% of the protein. But when you add in their Tango, the ASA, ASO, it upregulates the good gene so that it does way more and that compensates for the loss of the other one. And so you end up with 100% of the protein. So that's all very well looking in a, you know, a petri dish, but does it work? Well, it hasn't been done in people yet, but it's amazing results in the mice. So now this is a little confusing. So this is a, a Dravet mouse. So what they do is they take a mutation that we've identified in children and they put it into the mouse. Now, so first of all, let's look at the normal mice. So these are normal mice that don't have any genetic mutations. And this is survival, so 100% survival, zero. And then this is how old they are, so birth up to nine months. So your black mouse here, normal mouse, <coughs> lives along, does everything that normal mice are supposed to do, all good. Okay? Then they put this mutation into a mouse, and then that's called the Dravet mouse. Now, the Dravet mice do much worse than the children. Um, and around about 20 days, they start seizing, and they seize a lot, and most of them die. And the ones that survive do very poorly. But what happens with the mice that they give the ASO? In ASO, it is injected into the spinal fluid. It goes in, um, it, it lasts, one injection lasts three months. And what happened with the mice, that, the Dravet mice that are treated with the ASO, is they don't seize and they all live. So it's, it is a remarkable, it's basically just reversing the phenotype to normal. And the Stoke Therapeutic are going to be starting trials in adult patients with Dravet syndrome uh, next year. So this is likely to revolutionize some of these really bad epilepsies. ASOs are already being used in neuromuscular disorders uh, in children, in fact, they're, um, you, you, they're, and, and with remarkable results. So we know this technology will work. Um, and we just have to be able to make it so that it, we get ASOs that are targeted at these epilepsies. So I've come to the end. I just wanted to um, thank uh, my funders. So HRC has been very generous to me, as has Cure Kids, have been fantastic. Uh, Ted and Molly Carr Endowment Fund and the estate of the Ernest Hyman Davis. And I've also been really lucky to have some uh, amazing philanthropic donations, which I've been really very grateful for. 
And also, I'd just like to say another really big thank you to all of the people and their families who have been involved in our epilepsy genetic research. Many of my patients, uh, you know, I feel like I've grown up with them, and it's always really sad when I have to say goodbye to send them to some adult neurologist. Um, but they're in my program forever, so I can get, come back to them. So a big, big thank you to all of the people who have made this research possible. Thank Thanks. All right, I have two more jobs to do this evening. Um, the first job is to thank Lynette for an incredibly inspirational lecture. As promised, she is, as you can see, a, a very engaging speaker. Um, but I think more importantly than the way that she presents her research, I hope everyone in the room um, will leave with the idea of the incredible groundbreaking science um, that Lynette is part of but perhaps more importantly, the implications of that science for the lives of real patients who are suffering from epilepsy. So it was a real tour de force, Lynette, as I knew it would be. Um, you certainly deserved the promotion. Um, if this was the final test, we won't be taking it away from you. Um, you did a remarkable job. And on behalf of the university, I would just like to um, give you this very small token that will allow you to remember this night for the rest of your life. <laughs> Before we uh, move into the listing of the food, um, I'm just going to close this moment um, and we go to the other end and we'll meet. Moto Koriro, Renas, Koriro, Tohu, Motenai, Momo Mahi, and Empire Tohu Mahi, Motato Nai, Tamriki, Mungai, Keo, Oteo, Renatena.